Margaret Atwood's The Testaments has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize before it's even been published. Hey everyone, I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader, and the shortlist for the Booker Prize was announced this morning, so it was very exciting. Um, I was at work, so I was I was trying to uh, respond to it online, like surreptitiously, <laughs> while uh, in between doing things at, at work. And I tried to make a video uh, reacting to the shortlist at lunchtime, and found that the sound uh, was so um, so much wind came into it that it was almost inaudible for a lot of it. So I'm trying to film again out here in the park. Um, I, I'm in Kensington Park at the moment and there's lots of parrots um, flying here, green parrots flying around making a lot of noise which you can probably hear um, but that's the risk you know of filming out in the elements. Um, it's also very grey so it might start raining on me and a uh, child may come up and start bothering me you know while I'm here talking about serious literature um, but, uh, uh, but I just wanted to give my reaction to the shortlist um, today because um, I'm so excited to talk about it. A really interesting shortlist and I have to start off like not bragging too much but you know in my last video uh, a wrap up for what I read in August, I gave my predictions of what might be, I thought might be on the shortlist, and I got four out of the six books right, um, which I think isn't too bad. Um, so I'm quite happy with this shortlist, but there are some issues with it, and I feel a bit critical, more critical about a couple books. Um, so I want to talk about all six books on the list, and um, those put books in particular, and um, yeah, just the whole list in general, and then give my predictions of what I think are in the front running uh, to win the prize in October. And then hopefully later on I'll film some more interesting footage at a very exciting event I'm going to, um, which is why I'm all uh, suited up. Uh, so to start off, uh, the, uh, the six books on the list, um, they were chosen from 151 books that were submitted for the prize, and then obviously there was the 13 books selected for the long list, and then six books made up of four female authors and two male authors and I don't think the gender of authors ever really matters you know it should be the quality of literature that matters but um but if it was you know a short list of six male authors you know I'd sort of go hmm and <laughs> worry about that um so that is good to see and it's interesting that two authors on the list uh, have won the prize before. That's of course Margaret Atwood who won uh, the prize previously for her novel The Blind Assassins and Salman Rushdie who won previously uh, for his novel Midnight's Children um, which also went on to win uh, the, the, the Best of the Booker Prize when uh, the Booker Prize celebrated an anniversary. And these two authors are some of the most nominated authors for the prize ever because uh, Margaret Atwood has been shortlisted for the prize previously in addition to winning the prize. Um, she's been shortlisted four times and Salman Rushdie has been shortlisted previously for the prize uh, three times and longlisted for the prize two times. So you know these are very well-known, well-established authors and that's one of the main criticisms I've seen of this prize uh, so far this year with the long list that these are all quite well-established authors. I mean obviously Atwood and Rushdie are part, a major part of the literary establishment, uh, but then also uh, Chikozi Obiyama um, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize before for his first novel, and this novel, An Orchestra of Minorities, is uh, only his second novel. And Elif Shafak, I believe, is the most well-read uh, female author in Turkey today. And uh, then Lucy Elman uh, has been listed for the Women's Prize before, and I don't know how well-known abroad Ber Bernadine Evaristo is um, but she's you know she's quite quite well established in the UK she's had quite a few books out but I think it's really great this prize is giving her more attention so I think it is valid that people's criticism of this long list that you know these are all books we've heard of before and a lot of the re big reason why a lot of people love the prize is because it introduces them to authors that they wouldn't have read otherwise and haven't come across before and that's one of the reason why I love book prizes too so but at the same time you know I, it's understandable that uh, the judges chose these books because the judges are very well read. Um, they are, you know, part of the literary establishment themselves. And if they regard these authors as some of the best authors working today, then of course they're going to pick them for the prize. But nevertheless, I don't think a lot of people, as many people, would have read uh, Bernadine Evaristo's novel or Lucy Elman's novel as have done um, if it wasn't for the prize giving them this attention. So yes, the other big issue with the prize is uh, that Margaret Atwood's novel hasn't been 
published yet, and a lot of people are upset about this. But I was glad in the last few weeks um, to take this opportunity to reread The Handmaid's Tale uh, because I've been told that The Testaments is very much a sequel to that. So it's good to be up on the, the story of that first novel if you're going to read this, this sequel to it, this much anticipated sequel. And I've never seen a build up for a literary novel as there has been for this novel. You know, I mean, there's like earlier this year, there was Black Leopard, Red Wolf, um, which had a huge amount of hype around it. And when Harper Lee published a, a new novel several years ago, um, there was a huge amount of excitement around that. But for Atwood's novel, you know, it's been heavily embargoed until its publication date. And she's going to be launching it at this big event um, in London, uh, which is sold out. I wasn't able to get a ticket for it, um, where a lot of different authors will be talking about the influence of The Handmaid's Tale. And then Atwood will be reading a piece from the, the Testament for the first time. And this reading is going to be broadcast across um, the UK in theaters, and I think at some parts around the, the globe too. And it's interesting, I don't know how many people are going to be interested in actually going to the cinema to see Atwood talking about her novel, but it'll be curious to see how many people actually show up for that. I mean, I'm going to go to that because, yeah, I think it sounds quite fun. You know, I mean, there's nothing, ugh, this fly keeps buzzing around me. So, you know, this is the problem of filming in nature. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it sort of feels like a, you know, Harry Potter-esque sort of build up for it, but it's for, you know, an actual adult novel. And now a helicopter is coming across and making a lot of noise and the parrots are screaming again, filming in the elements, people. Oh my gosh, there's a swan coming over too. A curious swan is coming over to me now too. Hopefully he's not going to like start hissing and attacking me. <laughs> so yes, The Testaments is a, a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale and it all we know about it is that it picks up 15 years after Offred's final scene in The Handmaid's Tale and is narrated from the perspective of three different women in Gilead. So it'll be interesting because we don't know, you know, the authenticity of Offred's tale in The Handmaid's Tale because this is a, a found document and, uh, you know, it's just her limited perspective of it. And because of her circumstances, obviously, she, she only knew a little bit about what was happening in Gilead in this dystopian future where women's bodies and their wombs were controlled by the state. And so, um, so yeah, I'm very excited to read this, this ongoing tale when it's finally published. And, you know, of course, no novel that is this hyped can live up to that hype. There's going to be a huge amount of criticism about it. I was talking about this with Matthew Schroffa today, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of set up to fail. But at the same time, there is that anticipation. And I think the Booker Prize shortlisting it is giving it that validity that yes, this is a really great follow up um, to Margaret Atwood's classic novel. So yeah, very, very exciting. And then of course, there is Lucy Ellman's mammoth book, Ducks Newburyport, which has been much talked about and uh, a lot of people have been, you know, diving into this this massive thousand page novel and interestingly if this novel wins um this will be the longest novel that has ever won the booker prize um the currently that uh, that trophy is is currently belongs to eleanor catton for her novel the luminaries which i think is about 835 pages uh, where this runs to a thousand pages and though it is a massive novel I keep recommending it to, to everyone you know I made a half hour long video um, talking about this novel because there's so much to say about it but mainly I think the the narrator of it who is an ordinary housewife uh, baking pies all day in o Ohio um, it really represents a kind of every man or every woman uh, of today because as she's baking this stream of information is going through her mind from news all around the, the world to news in her local community to the concerns of her family and people in her community and this is all happening in her head at once and it's a combination of uh, opinions and conjecture and which is sort of taken as fact and twisted as fact but also the main reason why I can't recommend this enough is because it is such a funny novel I was literally laughing out loud for a lot of it and uh, just really stick with it and if you get to, uh, there's a scene at a dentist where a, a dental hygienist is, is taking care of her um, and, and using this new treatment on her. And it's just absolutely hilarious, her reaction to it and her bitterness about this dental hygienist. It's just so funny. Um, but there's so many smart, clever observations in this about modern life in general. So uh, yeah, highly recommend trying this novel. You know, don't be scared by its length. 
Uh, then, of course, there is Bernadine Evaristo's novel Girl, Woman, Other, that is about 12 different women, uh, many of them British, many of them black, a number of them are queer, and all of their stories combine together um, to sort of reflect upon each other, um, so you get each of their perspectives, but also the perspectives of the women on each other, and this forms like a lattice work of, of all these different stories coming together and different perspectives coming together, and in, in the most entertaining and beautiful way. Um, I was really engaged by several of their different stories, but it's the novel that I most want to go back and reread because I feel like that'll be really rewarding because I'll see the different perspectives of the women on each other, I think, much more clearly um, to get, a, a, you know, this sort of social perspective of these different individuals. So it's an incredibly thoughtful novel, and it's one of my favorite on the list. Then there is Salman Rushdie's novel, Quixote, um, which is his modern play on the Don Quixote tale about a man who travels across America in search of a love who may be um, an illusion. It's not somebody he's actually talked to you before. And I'm really interested in this novel for a couple of reasons. So I've been more interested in Rushdie because I've been listening to this podcast about the fatwa which was placed upon him, swatting flies left and right as we go along. <laughs> and uh, and uh, But also I hope that the novel captures all the absurdity and uh, humor uh, that is in Don Quixote because it's a really funny novel. So I'd, I'd like to see this this modern spin on it. Um, then there's Elif Shafak's novel, 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world, uh, which is about a prostitute who has been murdered in Istanbul and left for dead. And as she's dying, her final thoughts, remembering her past and her life and the people who have influenced her and been friends to her throughout her life, even though she's um, been been marginalized and taken advantage of in a lot of ways and encountered a lot of hardship. Um, so it's sort of about the beauty of friendship and the beauty of improvised families coming together in times of need, you know, especially people who have been marginalized. Now, there has been a critique lobbed at um, a lot of Elif Shafak's work that she sort of puts the politics before the literary quality of her novels and or, or sort of the storytelling of her novels. And, you know, I think that is true in a way. I was sort of debating this with with the author Mark Nash um, in the, the comments section. And uh, yet I can see how that happens. I mean, she's a very politically involved author um, and she, she does a lot of journalism um, as well as writing novels. And uh, But, uh, but I, I still find her, her fiction really moving and her character is very believable. And so, you know, I really enjoyed this novel. Although I do wish that there was more about the, the present day story of Leila Tequila as she's known in the novel. Novel. That's that's her name in the brothel, um, and uh, because she's such a, a feisty and lively character, that I, I wanted to see more of her in the present day. I mean, you sort of get her memories, and then you get um, the memories of her through her friends later on in the novel. Uh, but I guess that's you know sort of the central tragedy of the novel is that we don't get to, to see her in person because she encountered this this early death and so you know that that is a, a quite a poignant thing um, about the the book itself as well um, and then finally there's Chigozi Obiyama's uh, novel an orchestra of minorities and you know I've been thinking about this novel more since it, it was on the shortlist and obviously the judges commend it really highly and and it's the the story of an ordinary farmer but uh, in Nigeria, who wants to progress his social status in order to uh, impress the, the family of the woman that he, he loves and marries. And, um, you know, and that's, that's quite a poignant tale, um, but it's, it's told through the perspective of his spirit guide that travels along him um, throughout his life. And I think this is a really innovative way of, of telling the story of an ordinary man, but also it, it has um, its problems as well, because that sort of distances you from the, that that character and and I found myself not being able to be as moved as I wanted to be by his story because it was at this distance but it is a novel another novel that I think I might reread um, before the winner is announced um, because uh, yeah I'd like to see if if there's more to this novel than on my first reading of it um, so you know I don't know if I'll reread the whole thing I might just reread sections of it um, but those are the six books looking at them all as a whole I would say the strongest contenders are Lucy Ellman's novel and 
and Bernadine Evaristo's novel. I think those are the two novels that'll have a strong chance of winning the, the prize this year. But let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Have you read any of these novels? Are you really interested in reading any of these novels now before the winner is uh, announced in October? Or might you read all of the novels? Uh, let me know in the comments below and we can have a chat about it. Before I go, I'm, uh, I'm very excitedly going to a pavilion outside the Serpentine Gallery and you can't see it but just behind me is um, the, the Serpentine Gallery which is an art gallery in Kensington Gardens and every year um, they commission an architect um, from around the world to uh, build a new pavilion outside of the Serpentine Gallery so the, uh, the Booker Party will be in there and uh, yeah it'll be really exciting to see what authors come along because this is a party to celebrate the long list as well as the short list because obviously the judges thought the, the all of the novels on the long list um, were worth worthy of commendation uh, but uh, and you know and there are books on the list that I would have liked to have seen on the short list um, especially Valeria Luiselli's Lost Children Archive I thought that was an extraordinary novel that was worthy of more attention and I really loved reading Jeanette Winterson's novel Frank Kistein um, which is so unique and playful um, as well as being really moving and uh, you know and then there's also Lanny and Nightboat to Tangier so you know those are novels I would really recommend reading you know even though they haven't been shortlisted for the prize these are still really great books uh, so I'm gonna go into the party now and see if I can do any filming there um, to, to show you because you know just for fun uh, but uh, but yeah I look forward to chatting with you in the comments below and I'll speak to you again soon bye <laughs> Having sequestered myself away from reviews and indeed newspapers for much of the last um, year, I encountered a press conference this morning at which a number of things were asked, which I feel it might be um, amusing, if not helpful, to address. Uh, there was a lot of comment about the length of Lucy Ellman's novel. It is as long as a breath as long as many, many ideas that tumble over each other and fill our hearts and minds. A thousand pages is as nothing. It's perfect in many ways. There was a lot of comment about the status and heavyweight nature of two of the shortlisted writers, both of whom have won the prize before. I think we had eight or nine previous winners who were automatically eligible this year, two of whom made the long list. I wonder, in retrospect, whether there is a slight unfairness to previous winners that the bar is set supernaturally high for them. Maybe our expectations want to be uh, as astonished as the readers of their previously great books were, and I think that makes it more astonishing that we have encountered Salman Rushdie and Margaret Atwood at the top of their game. But I would also say that what we have encountered is a publishing industry of such vibrancy and adventure, of extraordinary devotion and care, superb editing, wonderful publishing, beautiful book design, stunning typeset. and. We've lucked into what must be the most phenomenal submission and nominations year that I can ever remember in my reading life. I am awestruck by what we've had sent to us every month in packets and boxes. Aside from the migrations that flow through these novels, or five of these six novels, and the pluralities and fluidities of identity that fill the pages of every great work of literature. If there are shared excellences in this, maybe it's that we admire the scale of the ambition of these six writers. They are extraordinarily meticulous in their delivery. They are 
full of humanity, they are politically and culturally engaged, they have a wonderful humour that they share with us, they have a constant uh, invention of form and style and an astonishing beauty of language, even when it is their second or their third language. They teem with life. They are full of a compassionate and, and celebratory humanity, and it's a joy, an optimistic, positive, inspired joy to read them. I congratulate all of them. I struggle with the idea that we might at some point have to choose one of them. I could happily and willingly stand up and celebrate any one of these six books as a winner of the Booker Prize with great delight and pride. I would like to think that all of these six novels are winners, not just today, but actually for always, because they are of uh, a quality that would enhance any library and any life. So I ask you, um, if you will, to join me in raising a glass to the three shortlisted authors who are here, Bernadine, Lucy, and Elif, and to their fellow shortlistees, this is an amazing year to be associated with the Book Prize. Thank you to all of you, thank you for coming, and to the writers and publishers, huge congratulations and thanks. Thank